Welcome back to the Media 7 Science Special from the ONG Glenville University of Auckland. Historically, we have been happier about receiving good news from science than bad. Unfortunately, the bad news tends to be of more urgent importance. In a special science source, Sam Mulgrew has the numbers on industry and the environment. Since colonisation, our 100% pure country has been something of an offshore farm, initially feeding Mother England and now another 150 mostly developing countries. Our butter exports make up almost half the worldwide market. New Zealand's dairy industry is so huge because we cut or burn down around 70% of our native forest for English grass. Not for croquet though. Kiwis have milked the farming cash cow for about as long as we've been Kiwis. It's our second largest earner behind tourism. And it's still booming. Dairy export income will rise 23% this year to more than $13 billion. Humans have for a long time been outnumbered by livestock. We've got tens of millions of animals and enough farmland to cover the entire landmass of Israel. But all this prosperity comes at an enormous cost. Our greenhouse emissions and water quality. Thanks in part to agriculture, 90% of our wetlands are gone. You can't swim in 43% of rivers and almost half our lakes are polluted. And it's not farting, but burping, which is the cause of our sky-high methane emissions. The gas has 25 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. Our methane emissions are five times higher than the global per capita average. It's probably our biggest global warming contributor, making up almost half our emissions miles ahead of all the other contributors. 100% pure is just a mirage. Boom. Sam Mulgrew there. I'm joined now by a man who has perhaps inadvertently become a media figure since his warnings about our waterways were put to the Prime Minister by a BBC interviewer, Dr Mike Joy of Massey University. And journalist and blogger at pundit.co.nz, Claire Browning. Welcome to you both. And Mike, as I said, you entered the limelight rather suddenly as a result of that interview with the Prime Minister. What has been the impact of that? Has it, has it made it easier for you to make a difference? Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to speak out more often. I mean, it, it, it's kind of sad that we need to have somebody from outside of New Zealand to, to highlight it to get the discussion happening, but I'm just glad that it's happening. On the other hand, a commenter on Claire's blog wrote, um, I fear for Dr Joy, chances are he's in danger of becoming the next Jim Salinger. That is that taking a stand might not be good for your career. Do you worry about that? I, yeah, I worry that it might not be good for my career, but luckily I'm in a university and I am free to speak out. And I, and I worry that, that New Zealanders think that, you know, because I'm the only one that's speaking out or one of the few, that, that maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not onto what's happening. But the reality is the Jim Salinger effect that the rest of the scientists are in, mostly in CRIs or research institutes or regional councils, and they, they, just, they just can't speak out because they will end up like Jim Salinger. And that, in your view, is a big problem, the fact, oh. the fact that, that effectively CRI scientists do not have the freedom that you enjoy. Totally, yeah. I mean, because I guess that people, if they don't hear from scientists, they assume that it's, that it's all good, and so that, that is a real worry. And as I said, you were bringing the bad news. Mm. Um, do you think things have improved in the past year as this has become more and more of an issue, the state of our waterways? I, ha I mean, we've had that national policy statement come out and I was very unimpressed with that. But I mean, the, the, the discussion has improved. I, I see a lot more, I read a lot more. I think that a lot more people are aware that there is a problem. So I think that's a, that's a, a, a big advantage, yeah. And Claire, you wrote that good news story, which I didn't actually read anywhere else, that, that Fonterra will now check every farm's dairy effluent system every year. They're calling the scheme every farm every year. Does that suggest that, that if you make enough noise about these issues, something will happen in the end? <laughs> yes and no. I mean, I, I, I think um, a lot of people have been making noise about them for a long time and not seeing very much happening. I mean, I think to pick up on Mike's point, um, the sad fact is that it took somebody from overseas to do it, and that's happened twice now. It happened with Stephen Sacker, and it happened with Fred Pearce. Fred Pearce is the guy who wrote the greenwash column in The Guardian, who said that New Zealand was giving two fingers to the global community, co comparing our Kyoto promises with our emissions profile. Um, so I don't know 
why New Zealand journalism is not doing it, but the fact is that, that, that there's a gap there. And, and you, you described what, what was happening at Fonterra and on dairy farms as a culture change. It sounds like, in your view, there's something major going on. I think it's got the potential to be something major, yeah. Um, I also think that to call it a good news story at this stage is, um, is an oversimplification. This particular story, it's not just about reporting the bad news. Um, it offers potentially a constructive path forward. Are you optimistic based on what Claire's written about, about what Fonterra are doing, Mike? Um, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> I know Emma and Emma Parsons, who's the person, she's the, the shining light in that, that organisation for the dinosaurs, and, and I'm really impressed with her. I know her dad. He so was that's one a of... harsh word. Let's <laughs> stop here. <laughs> Is that making you any friends using words like dinosaurs? No, but I mean, you, you only have to look at what they're doing. The way that the denial process, the, the business, I, I've seen them in action. I've seen them in action when it came to Horizons Regional Council trying to do something about what's actually going to fix the problem, which is controlling the intensity of farming in New Zealand. And I saw how much pressure, I saw how much pressure they put on the scientist at Cawthron who wrote the report on the Manawatu River that showed how bad it was. These guys play rough when, when they want to. We, we, we're just getting forced to extreme corners. I mean, I, I, you know, Emma's dad, who's a dairy farmer, it, is one of the great ones. I know lots of them that are doing fantastic work, but the extremists are the ones that get into to federated farmers and, and start throwing around the kind of red herrings. You know, the only one of our freshwater fish species that is doing all right is the red herring, and that's what federated farmers are throwing out to try and, you know, part of this denial process that they're involved in. To be fair, there has just in the last few weeks been a change at the top of Federated Farmers and it's going to be really interesting to see, um, to see how the discussion evolves from here. Um, I do think it's been a problem. Um, I think in particular it's a problem when you know, journalists will just go and stick a microphone under the nose of the nearest Fed Farmers representative they can find. There are good farm stories out there. You know, the, um, the Greens have documented some of that, Fonterra's documenting some of that itself. I mean, journalists could be pointed in the right direction if they wanted to go and ask the questions and find the different stories, but, it, but it's just, um, you know, they, they go to the obvious source every time and, and, and it's not representative. Why don't you think this story is reported better? Because when you look at it, it could be seen as our two big export industries uh, suddenly can't live together and we have to do something about that. Surely that's front page news. I think it challenges assumptions. I mean, everybody's assumptions, the journalists included. Um, I mean, you know, you, you look at New Zealand, we, we look quite empty, we, we look quite clean, um, and, you know, it's, dairy's always been our national story, we've always done it. Um, we, we pride ourselves on, on growing food for the world better than anyone else in the world. I mean, to stand up and challenge that, I think, is actually really difficult. I do it because I've got nothing to lose, I guess. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's actually, it, it's a hard thing to do, I think. Mm. Mike, you, you um, often does not end up in a war of words with farmers and federated farmers in particular. Is there a way past that? Do you, for instance, when you talk to farmers on a personal level, have, have a better conversation? Yeah, I think there's a real gap in, in the way that the, the, the rural media present the problem. You know, when I have time to explain it, if I could, whenever I have farmers to, as students and can take the time to explain the problem to them, then they get it and it's and and they change. It's just that no one's, no one's ever taken the time to to explain the problem and what what they're doing and why it's happening. Once I get an opportunity to to show that I'm not I'm not anti-farming, I'm 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 all for farming, but I just don't want to see our future destroyed for the sake of a, you know, sort of um, a, an economic imperative to, to just you know, make money hand over fist while we can kind of thing so without thinking of the how do, we, how do we just, just finally, how do we translate that, that, that understanding? Because it appears that you, you know, if you meet people directly you can, you can achieve a shared understanding. How do we achieve that at a national level and in the media space? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it's, it's just the being able to do what I do with my students, take them into the field and, and take them to the stream and talk about it. If, if, I, if, if scientists had an opportunity to do that, I think that we, we could get our point across much better. With every single farmer. Well, here's hoping. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Joy and Claire Browning. It's time now to touch base with a man who has been 
communicating science since long before we had such a thing as science communicators. Jose Barbosa spoke to Dominion Post veteran Bob Brocky. For nigh on 10 years now, the readers of the Dominion Post have been treated to a regular column illustrating the world of science. It's called the world of science. <laughs> written by this bloke. Hello, I'm Bob Brocky. Bob's worked as a scientist for DSIR, DOC, Victoria University and the British Museum. His aim is to demystify science for the layperson. You know, it's gobbledygook. You can, and when I first read these, I can only understand about 1%. Isotope fractionation, silicate melts by thermal diffusion. And I have to uh, read it lots of times before the penny drops, and I think, well, that's amazing, and I have to tell, tell everybody about it. I used to be a convener of the Royal Society's Committee on Scientific Problems of the Environment, and for six years we spent a lot of time looking at heavy metals in the New Zealand environment, 245T, cell phones, those sorts of things, and got all sorts of experts, you know, cancer specialists, statisticians, and often there's nothing to be worried about, or very little to be worried about. Yet the public has absolute fear of these things. I, yeah, I think the media has a big hand in it, in that uh, in today's paper or today's primetime news, there's a disaster du jour. So the public perception of a lot of these risks is very different from the specialist's view of it. And I tend to go along with the specialist's point of view. Bob's also a dab hand with the old feather and ink. He's a cartoonist for the National Business Review, a job he's had for 35 years. For some reason, rather the Business Review still runs my stuff. Every week I expect to get a brown envelope saying my services are no longer required. But they're very tolerant. Only two or three cartoons I've had to alter there. Yes, I once drew a, a critical cartoon about the business round table, not realising that the owner of the paper was the was their direct president that year or secretary. <laughs> he said, this isn't going in my paper. Yeah. Strangely enough, Bob can count among his readers the famous and powerful. But, um, I had a letter, 22 pages of testament from God and his wife, who said that owing to the um, excessive use of filthy marital aids and other nasty sexual practices, the world was going to end on the 28th of January. Uh, he left no forwarding address, so I couldn't reply to him. But I noticed the letter had been posted from the Manor Street Post Office. And it's very hard to change people's opinions, very hard to change the general public's view of things. So uh, I, hope, I hope in my articles I'm able to do that, but I'm probably dreaming. So here's the Bob Brocky, the sweetest curmudgeon you're ever likely to meet. Jose Barbosa talking to Bob Brocky there. After the break, is there a Maori way of doing science?